Hello everyone. Welcome to our Friday forecasting talks. Today we have a fascinating talk by Nicola van der Poot and uh, he will be talking about best practices for supply chain demand forecasting. But before we move to his talk, I wanted to say a couple of words about the center, what we do and so on. So this slide shows you what services we provide and what expertise we have. You can see that we provide some bespoke, show, sh bespoke short courses, a bit of consultancy, summer projects. And we help in developing software and we have several brilliant PhD students. Um, we have expertise in a mixture of uh, a variety of topics, including analytics, wider uh, term, with marketing analytics, marketing research methods, supply chain forecasting, and in fact, uh, all the people on this slide are involved in forecasting in one way or another, uh, a bit of machine learning and other things. So you can see our team here, and uh, I think this is uh, everyone here. Just to point out that Mardi is expected to join us in January, and Robert says that he's retired, but uh, we do not believe him because he's uh, with us and no, no matter where we go, no matter what we do. So he's still a part of our team. I think that's it from me. So let's go to the presentation of Nicolas Van de Put. Uh, so Nicolas, over to you. Perfect. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Yvon. Let me uh, share my screen and uh... Hello everyone, it's it's really a, a, a huge pleasure for me to be here uh, talking to you. I will do my very best in the next half an hour to share all the best practices, the best best practices I know about demand forecasting to basically help you out to make not just the most accurate forecast, but the most um, useful forecast. It's not going to be your usual webinar because I will ask you a few questions where you will be able to answer and we're going to see how the team and the crew here is uh, behaving so you can expect some uh, interaction. Maybe just really like in a minute just to introduce myself. I like to say I'm just a genuinely uh, passionate person about demand forecasting and inventory optimization. I've only been uh, working on these two subjects since I think at least 2016. I published book about it. I'm teaching both subjects um, in uh, Brussels here in Belgium next to my house but also in Paris in France. I'm working as a consultant, so I have my own consultancy business, and I'm also part of another startup who's making um, online uh, forecasting skew science. If you're interested to um, do forecasting online, you can just uh, click on skew science and, and get an account there. Otherwise, if you want to learn more about this subject, you can obviously check my book. Okay, but that's not the point of uh, today's webinar. We would like to learn about demand forecasting. Before we go ahead, I would like you to register on this website and to connect on this very specific link that you see on the screen. Perfect. And I see that people are coming in. That's perfect. So, OK, let's go for the first um, slide. So basically, before jumping in, let's make a good forecast. I always like to take the time to, you know, take a step back and try to first understand. But why are we forecasting demand in um, supply chain? So let me ask this question directly to you and you can now take a, uh, you, you can type your own answer. I've just opened the question on WooClap now. So please take, take a minute to think about it. Why do you think you are or we need to forecast demand in supply chains? To already see some good answers. We want to take better decision. We want to manage inventory, supply planning. I see someone more on uh, decision and inventory. It makes a lot of sense. A lot of people are interested in inventories. I just love it. Thank you so much. Prevent stockouts, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, meet demand, yes, of course, covering risk. Yeah, the better you are at demand forecasting, the better you can cover for the risk. Uh, prepare to deliver the product, that sounds like a very good answer as well. Stock optimization, thank you, sir, or madam, I love this. Maximize customer service, yeah, that, 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 that makes a lot of sense. Um, so let me let me try to summarize um, some of the answer and, and give you my own feeling here on why we need to forecast demand. And as you're going to see, it's very important. And I'm just not asking this for um, for for just for the sake of it or for the, the sake of philosophy. Um, basically, what I like to say is 
we need to forecast demand. We need to forecast the future because we want to make a decision. We want to act now. So basically forecasting demand, that's a means to an end, but that's not the end itself. Actually, as demand forecaster, we are just here to help out other people to take the right decision. It could be supply planning, it could be inventory, it could be production, it could be anything. But basically we are helping out other people to take the right decision. Um, I like to make as a joke to my students to say that there is one answer that no one said here. No one said we would like to forecast demand just for the sake of it because it's a hobby. That's a good answer for me or maybe for Yvonne. That's a hobby. We just do it for fun. But actually as a supply chain, you don't want people to do that for fun. You want people to do that because the other team needs to take some, some decision. OK, let me move ahead. Um, as a consultant, I created this kind of four dimension, four step framework to help companies to basically set up the perfect demand forecasting process. So what we're going to do now is that we're going to move in this framework step by step, and I'm going to help you out to think about each step, but also to set it up for your own supply chain, your own company. Basically, my premise here is that if we carefully think about each step, we're going to make the perfect process. Now, you need to pay attention to something that is critically important here is that we forecast to take action. We forecast demand because we want to help the rest of the supply chain to take the right decision. OK, that's extremely important here. So first thing, as a forecaster, we can forecast so many different granularities and temporalities. You can make a forecast per product, per brand, at, 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 at the country level, per store, per region, per channel and so on. You can also do a forecast per day, per month, per week, per year. You can do a forecast for the next 20 days, but you could also do a forecast for the next five years. So basically, as a demand forecaster, you have so many different forecasts you could poss possibly make. Um, now, it's very important because now you have all these choices and you may be thinking like, wow, that's, that's a bit too much. I didn't thought about it so much, but it's true that I can have all these different forecasts. Now, the real question is, what are we interested in as a supply chain, as a business? Now, keep in mind, as we just discussed, that we are doing this. We are forecasting demand because we want to help the other team in our supply chain to take the right decision. So basically, the question we should ask ourselves is which aggregation level will help us? Will, when I say us means our supply chain, your company which aggregation level will help you to take the right decision. If you need to take some decision at, for example, the product level per store, definitely that's what you should be forecasting. Let me show you some uh, example here. So I like in, in, in my training usually to always show three different types of, of types of decision in a supply chain. So first short term. So for example, if the kind of question you're asking yourself is how much to ship, how much to produce, where should I send these goods? Typically, you are kind of a logistic manager and you need to have very detailed forecast. So a useful forecast for you, a helpful forecast, would be a forecast per SKU, per store, per day. That's something that you can use to take these kind of decision. Now, along the supply chain, you would also have someone like a plant manager, but a plant manager might use a forecast at another aggregation level. Maybe you're planning the production, um, production capacity per week, and you have one plant in the world, so you're not interested to have the forecast per country, per client, or per channel. No, what you want to have is a forecast that's basically global because you just produce for the whole world. Now we have something else, someone here, someone else here, sorry, the marketing strategy. So someone like this might be interested just to, you know, have the forecast per brand, maybe per quarter or per month, and maybe by channel, so you can plan the right promotion. Now, what we can see here, and my advice for you listening to this webinar is, you should really think when you generate a forecast, when you work on a forecast, you should really think, who am I giving this forecast to and what kind of decision is it gonna do? I've seen countless companies that just use as a default, huh, we forecast by month, 12 months ahead by country, because, well, that's the by default uh, in our software, right? Yeah, that's the default in the software, but is it really what you need? Do you really need to take monthly decision by country? In most cases, I don't think so. I think that you need to take decision per warehouse or per plant or maybe per channel, but not for sure by country. OK, um, let me move on to a next question and you will again have to take um, to take a decision here and to vote. 
So again, if you didn't have the time to uh, go in WooClap, now you have another minute to go there and to, to register. I see we already have 61 uh, people, so that's great. So let me give you a case here. I just told you that you could forecast by day, you could forecast by week, and you could forecast 10 weeks ahead or 50 weeks or ahead, right? But actually, we should pay attention to exactly what we are interested in. Okay. Let me tell you a small story, and you're going to have to vote and decide what's important to do here. So let's imagine you are a supply planner, and you have a, a, a supplier that's located three months ahead. So it means that when you do an order, like right now, you're going to receive it in three months. Let's imagine you have an order process where you make an order at the end of the month. So typically now it's the end of October. So you're going to make an order now that you're going to receive. So that would be the end of November, the end of December, the end of January. You're going to make an order now that you will receive at the end of January. OK. My question. So you are this uh, supply manager. So you go to the demand forecasting team and you tell them. Well, I, I went to uh, Nicola van der Put classes and he told me that you should work for me to provide me meaningful information so I can make the best order. Now you need to say as a supply manager to the demand forecaster what horizons you should be working on. Should they work on just improving M1 forecast, working on M2, working on M3, working on M4, M5, M6? I don't know. As human, we can only focus on a few funds, so you need to tell the team OK, please pay very much attention to this specific month and this specific horizon in the forecast. Now I'm going to open the question for you and you need to vote on which horizon you think is the most important for your team to focus on. So again, you are a supply manager, you take, you're making an order once a month and you're making your order three months ahead. Should you ask the team to focus on M1, M2, M3, M4 or a combination of these? Now, what's very interesting with this question is that usually I'm, I'm asking this question when I'm doing a, a training with uh, practitioners at companies, and it's most of the cases I people will give me different answers, which means that people are not aligned within the same company on what's interesting to forecast. Like, what, what should we focus on? People are not aligned within the same supply chain. Okay, thank you everyone for your answer. So, as we can see on this screen, it seems that we have a very strong team on M1 to M4. We have a few people that think that no, it's just about M3, it's just about M4. We have some people here that are a bit in between and someone from M1 to M3. Usually when I give this training, I have to say that most people would reply something like it's only M3 or only M4. That would be most people over there, but I see that we already have a strong team right there today. Let me give you my opinion on what we should be uh, trying to forecast. Now, right here, as you can see, I'm going to do my order, which I'm going to receive at the end of uh, M3, as you can see on the computer. Now, when you think about it, the previous, the two previous orders, it's already fixed. I already know I'm going to receive 40 units here, 30 units there. I can only decide to change this 80 here. OK, so this is already fixed. Now, obviously, your inventory position right there, so you see it's starting from 150 today down to 70 pieces will be impacted by whatever demand you're going to face in M1 to M3. Right now, you cannot change the 70 anymore, but you must realize that if today we decide to change the forecast for M1 or the forecast for M2, it will have an impact on 70. For example, if today you come to me with, a new, with some news about a client and you say, well, they're not going to buy 50, they're going to buy 60. It means it will have an impact on the 70 here because we will consume 10 more, 10 units more. So we're going to end up at 60 units, right? Now this means that the inventory position here will be impacted by any demand forecast on M1 to M3. So anything from M1 to M3 is interesting for us. Moving ahead, the order you do today will be consumed over M4, right? So you also need to know the forecast for M4 to know, okay, do I need 80 or do I need zero pieces? Actually, I can even push this further by saying that, well, with this setup right here, I have an inventory position at the end of M4 of 100 units. But is this the good decision? Do I really want to have 100 pieces at the end of M4? Actually, that's not sure, because depending on the forecast you have in M5, you might want to have more stock at the end of M4 or less stock at the end of M4. Let's, for example, imagine that at during M5, that's the end of the season and forecast is zero, or maybe um, your product will be totally outdated or replaced by something else. So basically, 
you don't assume that you will have any demand for it as a M5. With such an assumption, it means that you really don't want to finish M4 with any remaining inventory. So instead of ordering 80 here, you might want to, find, to say, well, I'm going to just order zero. Now, as you can see, we have a lot of scenarios here. And basically, to take the right decision, which is how much should I order, we need to have a good forecast from M1 down to M5. Now, this slide is very, very important because I've seen so many supply chains that basically say things like, well, most of our suppliers have a lead time of three months, so we will only forecast M3. Or we will only focus on M1, M2, and I've seen it today, and M12. It's very strange. Well, actually, when you do the maths, when you look at planning, you understand that every single month is important, right? So if today you're just focusing on M3 and M1, please reassess what horizon you're using and which month you are tracking. Again, my point here is before we discuss models, before we discuss data, we should at least align on what's the granularity and what's the horizon that we are interested in. OK, let me move on to another subject that's very, very important for supply chains, demand collection. So the first thing we have to understand about supply chain is we should pay attention to this. We should never forecast sales, but we should always forecast demand, right? When you think about it, we again, I'm back to my first slide. We want to forecast demand because we want to help the other team to take the right decision. OK, now, if you're just trying to forecast the sales and, for example, you heard that right now you have no inventory, it's very likely that your sales are going to go down to zero. So if I'm doing a sales forecast, so you're my manager and you ask me, Nicolas, can you do a sales forecast for me? I don't need to be a genius. I don't need to use machine learning. I will just tell you sales equals zero because we have no inventory. OK, now, as my forecast is zero, we're going to hand this over to the supply manager. And the supply manager will think, OK, how much should I produce? The expected sales are zero, so I should also produce zero. And by doing this, we get into a very vicious circle where me as a demand forecaster, I forecast the sales to be zero. It goes back to the supply manager who's going to produce zero because it's forecast is zero, and then you end up just doing zeros. OK, it's very bad. Instead, we should forecast demand. Now, I'm not a person of definition, but I think it's very important that we define demand. Demand, it's basically what's in the mind of your client. So when these kids that you see on the screen are going to buy ice cream, demand is what they have in mind. It's very, very important that we all align on this definition of demand. It's the initially requested quantity, type of product, and delivery date that your client have in mind. And this is what you want to forecast. Again, you don't want to forecast the sales, the invoice or whatever. You want to forecast what your client wants so you can produce in time and supply in time. Now, in order to forecast demand, because as we're going to see, capturing demand is very difficult. We need to understand but what happens when we're out of stock. Why? Because basically, as long as you have inventory, if you have a client coming to your store, your website or your supply chain or calling you, well, you can match this demand with supply and you get sales and then it's fine. It's recorded in your system. It's recorded in your ERP. Everything is fine. But you start to have issue when you have demand coming to you and you're missing inventory. And at some point you don't get the sales and something happens. Now, you know, it's very important to know your supply chain, know your client, know yourself, basically. And what happens if you are out of stock? You need to know. Will my client look for another product? Then maybe I need to look at my data set for any replacement activities. Will my client will be back later? Are they just out or do they go to the competition? It's very important that we understand your supply chain so we, we can better capture demand. Now, to capture this demand, what we need is something called a sales order management system. And it's very important that we track all the unfulfilled orders. So basically all the people that say, I'll be back, we are able to track this. And we don't duplicate the order if they come back three days in a row. We also need to record what was the initial date they put in the system. And I've seen more and more in supply chain people hacking the system that when they know they're out of stock, they get an order, they just cancel it and put it back later. Basically, they do that so they can show a high service level despite the fact the orders couldn't be fulfilled in time. Now, if people do that, they hack the system and we don't track demand anymore, but again, we just track sales. Finally, it's very important that you can record any cancellation and you can put a reason to that. 
Two people cancel because it's out of stock. Two, they cancel because they're going to take something else or they just cancel because they don't want it anymore. They don't need it anymore. OK, by doing this, you'll be able to move from sales forecasting to demand forecasting. Now, I know what most of you are thinking right now. You might be thinking, hmm, OK, Nicola, thank you. That's for the theory, but in practice, it's very difficult to do. Indeed, well, that's definitely not easy to do. But what you need to keep in mind is every single small step you do in direction of capturing better data will help you to make a more useful forecast. Again, if today you would hire me as a consultant to make a forecast, you would send your data set to Yvon, to Lancaster, to whoever, but you just include sales and you, you, you just send a, a crappy data set. Me or anyone else, we can make a model for you to try to crack it and get a good accuracy. But basically, we are not forecasting the right thing. So what we would do is useless. It would just try to beat a number, but it's useless because we don't forecast the real demand. OK, so overall, in just a sentence, bad data will be the good forecaster every time. And it's very important that you work on finding real demand instead of sales. Let me move on to the next concept, metrics, and you know that I love this. So when we look at forecasting accuracy, we basically need to pay attention to two different things, accuracy and bias. And both are very important and both are telling us very important things about your process. Obviously, what you want is to be accurate, which means that you need to be close to the target. But you also want to be unbiased, which means that in average, you don't over forecast or you do not under forecast. Let me show you an example. I lost the PowerPoint here. Voilà. Now, before we discuss the metrics a bit more, again, and it's the same message because it's so important, we want to find metrics that allow us to make a useful forecast for a supply chain. Because we have so many metrics and we can come up with even more metrics. I'm sure Yvonne could talk a lot about metrics as well. But basically, we want to choose a set of metric or just one metric that is helpful for a supply chain and that would allow us to select a useful forecast, a useful model for the rest of the teams, right? Always keep in mind, we are doing this forecast to help the rest of the supply chain. Now, I have again a question for you. It's a very simple one and I show you the metric on the left side. So you have a product on the left side of the screen, the blue one, and you have three different forecasts, right? Forecast one, two, and three. My question for you is, which is your favorite forecast? And I'm showing you different metrics. You can do whatever you want to choose your favorite forecast. You can look at the metric or metrics, or you can not even uh, look at the metrics. Do it the way you want. You should just choose as a demand forecaster, okay, which forecast seems to be the best for you. Let me open this part. Oh, there you go. Now, as you reply, I have a, a funny, um, a funny thing that happened with this question. So I, I've been asking this question to a lot of people because I'm, I'm asking this question in every training I do at university or with a professional. And what I've seen recently is that the opinion of people, so basically if you would choose forecast one, two or three, uh, will change if I show you the, the metrics. And it's very interesting to see that if I show you the same thing without the metrics, you might choose some forecast. But then if I show you the metrics, you might change your opinion on which one is the best. So it's very interesting to think that just to see the numbers, it's influencing you on which one you prefer. Okay, so I have 25 votes here, and I see that, um, well, it's nearly half-half between forecast one and forecast two, with just two of you thinking forecast three is the best, which is very interesting. Um, now, obviously, we, we don't have the time and we have a lot of people on the webinar, so I cannot really discuss with each and every one of you on why you, you preferred forecast two over one or one over two. But it's very interesting to realize that already we cannot even agree on which one is the best forecast. Even if we see them, even if we have the KPIs, we wouldn't really agree on which one is the best one. Now, what I've seen with KPIs so far is basically bias in a supply chain is extremely important. So you wouldn't want to have any forecast that has a bias that's more, let's say, an average more than minus 5% or plus 5%. That would be extremely bad for supply chain. Now here, forecast 2 and 3 with a bias of minus 32% and minus 48%, it would make the life of your supply chain impossible. I don't think you can plan any supply chain when your forecast, in average, it's 
um, too low by 30 to nearly 50 percent. It means that when you expect really to sell a million, you're going to just produce and plan for half a million. It just makes no sense. At some point, you will face so much shortages. Now, what we see with this bias is that maybe, as um, I mean, all of you following me, you know how, how much I don't like maybe. Maybe it's totally uncorrelated with bias. And actually, if you have a forecast that's highly under forecasting, so with a bias of minus 48 percent, this is when maybe gets the, 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 the best score, right? So we see that here maybe is just pushing you to under forecast demand, which is a very bad thing in a supply chain because you want to be unbiased. On the other hand, we see that RMSE here will result in an unbiased forecast and the two are somehow correlated. So the best forecast in RMSE is also achieving the lower bias. Now, maybe some of you, you're listening to this and you're a bit confused on, okay, but like what, what KPI should it really follow here? Especially that RMSE is not so easy to compute and comes with a, with a few other um, issues. Um, Basically here, what I like to say is first the issue of maybe is that it's so biased and it's a good reason why we should never use maybe because it's basically just pushing you to under forecast. Now we have ME and RMSE and one of the issue of RMSE is the fact that it's kind of difficult to compute, it's difficult to explain to people and it's also sensitive to outliers. So instead we have MAE, which is very resistant to outliers, easy to explain, but it has an issue. It often results in a biased forecast, right? So what we can do, wait, first, you should never use maybe. I mean, that's that's really baseline. I would really not advise you to use maybe in your supply chain. And if that's the current KPI you track, you should really move on to something else. And I'm going to tell you right now which is a much better choice. What is a much better choice? So instead, I would advise you to track the mean absolute error as well as the bias. So one of the issue as the mean absolute error is that it often results in a biased forecast. But if you track both, if you try at the same time to say to your planners, well, you need to be accurate. That's why we're going to track mean absolute error and you need not to be biased. And that's why we track bias. By doing these both things, you will basically be sure that people are close to the target and in average are on target. Both are very important in supply chain. Now you can push this further. How can you push this further? Uh, normally, if we would be with just 10 professional or in a classroom, I would just look at you and say nothing until someone comes up with an answer. But right here, it will be a bit difficult. So I'm going to just answer my own question. Um, a better idea would be to use weighted metrics. So basically, you want that when you compute the mean absolute error over your whole supply chain or the bias over your whole supply chain, you weight each product based on the value or cost or sell price. Basically, if you sell very different product with very different value or cost, you want that when you compute the total KPI for your supply chain, the few products that you sell that are worth a lot of money, you want them to have more impact on your KPI. I've seen so far a lot of supply chain that don't do that, but they start selling product with very different values. So you might sell a few products that are worth like one euro and some product that are worth a thousand euros. Obviously, you don't want both products to account for the same importance in your final KPI. Okay. Um, now, let me in the next five minutes discuss a bit the process with the final advice for you. And I think that's the most important thing you can do as a supply chain to improve your process. So let me try to describe very quickly what a supply chain demand forecasting process looks like. Usually you start with a forecast baseline, something just out of a forecasting software. And then your forecast moves to the demand planners. Usually they do a great job. They update the, the, the SKUs. Maybe they heard about some specific orders from some clients. They are tracking a new product introduction and so on. Then this goes to the sales team. Often the sales teams, they have some kind of a, a bias because maybe they want to secure some inventory. So what they do is they're just going to increase the total volume of the forecast. And then you have maybe a SNOP consensus meeting, or maybe this goes to finance and then they're going to still adjust the forecast. But then again, we have an issue because what they want usually, or in this fixtures example is we want to match budget because we have pressure to be aligned with budget. So they're going to change your forecast to align it with budget. Now, if you see this and remember, we want this forecast to take action, so it needs to be helpful. You want to be sure of two things. You want to have efficacy and have efficiency. Basically, you want to be sure that if anyone touches the forecast, they add value, they make it more accurate. 
But also, you don't want people to spend so much time in the forecast. So you don't want someone to work five months on just updating one product in your forecast, right? How do we do this? We have a tool or a framework called Forecast Value Edit. Again, this is my number one advice for you. This is the most important thing you can do right now to improve um, your uh, demand forecasting process. The thing we're going to do is we're going to track the accuracy or the error of each step in your process, starting with, and that's really an advice, starting with a benchmark. Like you just do a moving average. You track the forecast error of this moving average, and then you just check that your forecasting model is more accurate than this moving average, but then that your demand planners, by doing all these modifications in the forecast, this also add value compared to this forecasting model, and so on. Then you're going to also track the sales team and the consensus meeting. Now, what we see on this KPI here is that the forecasting model, they just made the benchmarks. That's great. They created value. They made the forecast more accurate. The demand planners as well, they worked on it and they made it more accurate. They reduced the error. But what we see is the sales team, again, it's just an example, made the forecast worse because they just wanted to um, increase it to have more inventory, right? And we also see that the consensus meeting didn't improve the forecast and just barely reduced the bias. So they didn't do a helpful job, right? The time was just not worth it. As you track forecast value and it, you can start to highlight teams that add value or do not add value to the process. And then you can start a discussion with them to help them out to improve your uh, forecasting accuracy. Now, and this would be out of scope for this webinar, but you have a lot of advice and a lot of techniques that would help you to make sure that the sales team, the, the, the consensus SNOP meeting, marketing people, finance people help you out to make a better forecast rather than just try to push it around and to politicize it. Now, one of the things we face here is that the concept of forecast value added, it's very clear and it's very simple to understand. You just need to understand that well. We have different steps. We're going to track the accuracy of each step and we're going to make sure that in this process, each step is adding value compared to the previous one. It's very simple. Now, the issue with this thing is that it calls for a lot of data and a lot of data manipulation. You need to save so many different forecast version. You need to save a version for each team. You need to save a benchmark. You need to save a forecast. You need to save so much data. Now, if you want to do this, unfortunately, that would be nearly impossible to do in Excel. And even if you code in Python or R, it would take you a while to handle all of this data and to automate the process. So unfortunately, if you want to do this, my advice is you would be much better off using a forecasting software because it would take you basically so much time to do it on your own. Here, I just want to highlight that I created this uh, startup through science. If you want to Track this forecast value edit. You can just create an account for free and give it a try and see how it works for your supply chain. You can obviously use so many different forecasting software that will also track it. My advice, never invest in a forecasting software that does not track forecast value edit because this is the number one uh, best practice that you need to do in a supply chain. And by the way, I can also thanks now, maybe he is on this webinar, Michael Gilliland, who was the first one in uh, the early 2000s who pushed for this concept and he even wrote a book about it. So if Michael, you're around, hello and thank you as usual for this um, framework. OK, I think that's it for me. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope these advices will help you to set up new best practices in your supply chain and ultimately will allow you to make a forecast that's more useful and helpful for the other teams. Thank you very much, Nicolas. Uh, that was interesting, and I think that uh, interactions worked well. Uh, now we have John Boylan, uh, who will act as a discussant, and he will provide some comments. So, John, over to you. Thank you very much, Ivan. And uh, can you see me OK, and can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, Good. sure. Oh, excellent. Right, OK, well, first of all, thank you very much, Nicola, for that talk. Um, I thought it was very interesting and also important that you've looked at really fundamental issues in business forecasting, which are often ignored. What we sometimes find is that when people talk about business forecasting, they're actually talking about forecasting. And the two things are not quite the same. Obviously, the, the same techniques can be used, but to understand business con uh, forecasting means to really understand the context. And I think you put that across um, very well. I particularly liked your um, uh, four-dimensional construct which you started off with um, and I particularly would like to say that the importance of the what to forecast 
this is really neglected. People talk a lot about how to forecast, but not so much about what to forecast. And I think the reason is because people think it's obvious. Well, we're forecast. Let's say the obvious answer is forecast sales. And as you pointed out, of course, it's not sales, it's demand. And of course, it's not just demand, it's demand at certain levels of aggregation and disaggregation. So I thought that was really great. And it reminded me of a very well known poem, which I'm sure will be known to many people on this call by Rudyard Kipling. I won't read it all, but just the first couple of lines, which is, I know six serving men, they taught me all I knew. Their names are what and why and when, how and where and who. And actually, all of those six elements are relevant to business forecasting, in fact. But we focus really heavily, and particularly in academia, we, we focus very heavily and maybe too heavily on the how. And as you've said, the what is important. In my experience, and when I have been dealing with organisations, it can sometimes help to understand the what by going one step behind that and asking the why question, which you did allude to, actually. So, but it's all very well you do forecasting. Very often organisations do forecasting because it's something they're expected to do. But why are you actually doing it? And sometimes worth asking that question, particularly if there's different functions, and you, you mentioned some of them, like marketing, like HR, and like supply, who are all um, linking together. And sometimes by asking that basic why question, it can encourage them to think about their planning process as a whole and the extent to which one should be informing the other. So, yeah, I really appreciated that. Thank you, John. So that was that's my first comment. Second comment, um, aggregation. Yes, absolutely agree with you. The right level of aggregation, really important. One thing, um, maybe you can come back when I've, I've finished my comments, but one thing I would be interested in is your thoughts about recent developments in hierarchical forecasting. So we totally agree you need to be clear on the target level, the, the level which you want for your forecast. But of course, we can use information at other levels to get to the level we want. So I'd be interested in what you what you have to say about that. Um, that was just something that struck me. The fundamental point about demand and lost sales is, is very well made because we always talk about demand forecasting. And as you say, very often we actually are not doing that. We're creating a sales forecast. So I think my questions really on this are the examples you gave of how you can get certain information about orders, about cancellation of orders, about the initial dates requested and so forth. That's great, but that does assume that there is an order. And obviously in a retail context, that doesn't exist. Somebody comes into a store, um, I, I quite like having porridge for my breakfast, and I find that a certain flavour of porridge is not available, so I get another and the um, flavour instead. I still buy some porridge, but I don't buy what I originally was intending to. And I'd be interested in your thoughts on that. I know there's been some work which links to your point about stockouts and recording when demand is going out of stock, but I'd be interested just to hear you expand a little bit about that. On the forecast error metrics, um, really key point that you made about bias. I absolutely agree with this, that really we should be looking from a supply chain perspective particularly both of bias and some appropriate measure let me just say appropriate measure based upon absolutes i'm not going to get into all of the um, you know the the disputes about mape and various other uh, mace and various other measures we we maybe discuss that on another day but looking at both dimensions i totally agree with and i think also something which you didn't say but i think it's important to say is if a, an organisation is not forecasting well at the moment, my advice would always be to look at the bias first, actually, because bias is often easier to correct than an absolute error problem. Of course, you can do both, of course. Uh, so I'm not saying you shouldn't look at the absolute errors and shouldn't try to improve that, you should. But very often, because of the process issues you described, optimism bias and things of that nature, or maybe not, it's not even human bias. It could just be they're using the wrong statistical method and therefore they get bias that way. But I would always go bias first and then look at the absolute errors. I'm also interested though in something linked to that because this is a key point is how do these measures then translate to inventory performance? So yes, we can look at bias, I agree, and we can look at absolute errors, also I agree. It's not obvious how the two directly link to inventory performance, but it is possible for organisations, not every month, but maybe occasionally to do a more detailed simulation analysis 
which may help them to understand a little bit more about that link. And it is not an obvious link, I appreciate that. But I think that's something which would fit in with your philosophy of being driven by ultimately supply chain performance, which I totally agree. Um, just something to think about there. The other thing I think you talked about process. Um, I think points very well made. I'd be very interested if there's any empirical evidence just on how much time planners spend on adjustment. I'm not sure if anybody's ever gathered that. I haven't seen it, but I'd be interested to know. And also, if there's any evidence out there of successful approaches to discourage people from, I think um, Robert's called it twiddling or fiddling with forecasts, just, you know, very tweaking them, just very minor adjustments. And as his study showed, this is a complete waste of time. Um, so we know that that's a bad thing to do. But I'd be interested if he's got anything on the um, on, on strategies that have worked. And my final point, which I just wanted to say, is about the forecast value added. I like the fact that in your FBA you have both the absolute and the bias, which was not in Mike's original book. I do have a copy of it here, just in case Mike's on the call. Great book, Mike. Um, and it really is it's good to do both. And again, if I go back to my earlier point, we could go even further than that. I've made this point, I think, on, on, in a previous call that strictly speaking, what Mike actually proposes is forecast accuracy added. And that's obviously very important, OK, clearly, but it's not strictly value because value is going to go into things like inventory performance, stock held, service provided and things of that nature. So that's just another little thought. So. They're the thoughts that struck me and thanks for sending the slides in advance because it meant I could prepare a little bit for my for my commentary. But I just want to conclude by saying I thought it was a really great talk and I'm delighted to see that so many people were on the call as well. I think that's um, really good that we've been able to reach um, a very wide audience today and I'd be interested in your thoughts um, in response to my comments. Wow. Well, um Thank you. Um, thank, thank, thank you so much, uh, uh, John, for this question. I, I had to take note because you asked six questions. I thought you would still have to three. Um, thank you so much for the question. It's very interesting. Some of them I have answered. It's just that I wanted to really keep this webinar to half an hour to go straight to the point. Obviously, I even have slides that answer all these questions. I have to say you asked a few questions that I was not expecting that are more difficult. I don't know which, which one I should start first. I try and I, I'm sorry to disappoint to answer them like in a minute per question because we have so many questions and I guess the public might have a few questions as well. So let me try to, to point out a few questions and I will reshare a, a few um, slides there so that it's very clear for everyone what I'm uh, advising to do. Let me go back here. Yes. So on the hierarchy here, I said I asked you one question. Uh, what's the objective? What do we want to do? And what we want to do is to help out the other teams, as you understand. So we need to understand what the teams are looking for in terms of forecast accuracy, uh, uh, aggregation. Now, usually in my training and classes, I'm asking a second question, which I didn't ask today, which is your question. OK, but shouldn't we work on another aggregation level to get there? And you are totally right. So, for example, I, I'm looking to do a forecast for my ice cream truck uh, because I do an order once a week, so I need to know the the expected demand on the week ahead. Now, to that's what I want to be accurate at the week ahead. But in order to do that, I might be interested to do a forecast day by day because I want, on Wednesday I know that school is out. On Thursdays there is a festival. On uh, Tuesdays there is a massive strike, and then I have much more information. I also know the weather per day, and then I can do a very accurate forecast, not just per day but per week. So to do a weekly forecast, I need to look at the daily forecast. Okay, so and. Again, what I like to say as well, it's it's all about data science and science in general. We do not know in advance which is the best aggregation level, so we need to try out different things in order to choose the right one. That's one one question down. Um, concerning the stockouts, and I don't think I have the slides right here, and it's a pity, but I have some more slides in another presentation. But indeed, I'm strongly advising supply chains to track the stock out. And I know that today most supply chains don't do it, but when you think about it, it's a very simple data. You just need to track every day what's your inventory status and track this. As soon as you track if you're out of stock, you can really say, OK, on Monday, the sales I saw was the real demand, but on Tuesday I was out of stock, so on Tuesday I do not know the demand. Now I'm working with a few companies and unfortunately it's confidential, but this, this is such an interesting business case to try to uncover the real demand in the past, saying on, on Monday we had inventory, so we know the real demand. On Tuesday we didn't, 
So we need to make a model just to uncover historical demand so we can make a real forecast because we need to buy past Tuesday. Now, again, we could discuss just about this subject for so long. My advice for anyone listening is start tracking shortages as of now because there is so much value for supply chain in tracking shortages. So many people send me questions about Nikola. Should we use uh, GDP to forecast or say it? Should we use the, the price of uh, uh, indexation and stuff like that? I don't think so. I think that you have so much value just by tracking pricing, marketing, promotion and shortages. So you should really start by tracking these things. OK, second question um, out. Um, the next question you asked me was about bias and you said I like to track bias first. Let me tell you, we can make a team because I also like to track bias first and it's telling, telling us a lot of things. Actually, bias is easy to track, but it also tells us a lot about uh, politics. Now, you mentioned some of the bias like optimist bias. So let me explain that for everyone who, who's not familiar with it. As human, most of us tends to be kind of optimist about the future. So if we ask ourselves to make a forecast about next month, we tend to over forecast by a few percent because we just see some good news. Now, what I've seen in supply chain is that if you have a lot of bias in your forecast, and most of, the, most of the time you do, it's not because human are optimists, it's because political reason. Some people want the forecast to be high because they want to be on the safe side. Some people want the forecast to be low because they want to beat the forecast to get the bonus. Now, by tracking forecasts, you can see the, these kind of political um, biases and you can start to find them. And for me, that would be a discussion with the sales team or the finance team on why do you always under forecast by 10 percent and why do you always over forecast by 10 percent? And as you said, this is going to drive some very, very um, interesting discussion. Um, now, unfortunately, what I do not have is an analysis of the time spent per person per, per, per hour on, on a forecast in average and how much this time relates to the forecast value added. I'm not aware of such an analysis. Maybe something exists. Nevertheless, it's great that the company start tracking it just to have a clue. OK, my sales team per month, they, try, they spend so much time in the forecast and that's the added value they have. Is it worth it? Because overall, you can always spend more time in it, but at some point it just doesn't add value anymore. Um, now it's very funny that you ask this question about do we have an idea on how much the, the planners spend time doing small uh, adjustments? Because usually in my training, I mention a paper from, uh, from your colleagues here, uh, Robert Fields, so actually, I can directly point the screen to him because saying he did the analysis and he knows the answer to this question and I do not. But what's really funny is that I, I use basically uh, um, his, his uh, analysis in my own uh, presentation. OK, so next last question, and I think this one is so interesting, is how does this relate to inventory? Wow, that, that is such a difficult question and such an interesting um, one. Um, basically, um, it's very difficult to see the link from one um, to, to, to the other because you could have a very good inventory policy, you could have a very bad one. If today your inventory policy is, I want to have three months of inventory, you improve the forecast accuracy, nothing will really change. You will just have higher service level, but the inventory volume is the same. So it's extremely difficult to link the two. My advice for supply chain is, if you want to be serious about supply chain excellence, you need to do both in parallel and have the same basically team and safe software doing both at the same time. Otherwise, it is not clear how you can get the, 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 for, the, the increase in forecast accuracy. It's not sure how it's going to translate to inventory optimization. And it's really a pity because there is so much money to be saved in inventory. But what I see here is that demand forecasting is sexy. You have machine learning, you have these human biases, you have so many professors like you, consultants like me working on the field and it, 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 we have traction on it. Now there is a field where there is no traction, it's called inventory optimization. This, I'm not aware of any big pool of people working on it. And for me, the money is in inventory optimization, but not so much in demand forecasting, which is kind of ironic, but okay, that, that's what it is. I'm trying also to push people to think more and more about inventory instead of forecasting. Well, John, I'm sorry, I couldn't answer this yeah. one. I would even add something. I would not trust anyone telling you if you reduce forecast error by 10%, you're going to win this much inventory. I would not trust anyone saying such a thing. That's great. Thanks very much, Nicholas. I, I think maybe I should um, allow time for other people to ask questions now, but thanks again. Thanks. Uh, I have Robert has a, a very short comment, maybe uh, for, for a minute or so. Uh, this relates to this discussion of uh, judgmental adjustments, right? 
and, and I think wasn't it the, uh, the the time spent on small adjustments. Um, I, I, do, I don't have the figures to handle uh, about how many small adjustments there are, but I think you could basically talk about 50% of adjustments being less than uh, a 50% change. So it's really quite a, a large number and I, I, I would say that it probably takes even more time to do a small adjustment than it do, does to take a large adjustment. But that's pure speculation. So there's still a, there is a lot of effort put into small adjustments. Great, thanks, Robert. Um, I think it's time that we move to questions and we actually have a lot. Uh, I'm not following the flow of questions, but I'll pick those that I think are the most interesting. There are several related to hierarchical forecasting. People are saying that this is an exciting thing and you've already touched it a little bit with John. But what in general do you think about uh, hierarchical forecasting and uh, is there a specific level that people should choose when they make decisions? Yeah, that, that's really the part where it goes more for me into really consultancy and knowing your supply chain rather than training. So in terms of webinar and training, the more I can say is you need to know your supply chain and you need to know what people in your supply chain are doing, but then we cannot push this discussion really further. So for example, you might be in a supply chain, you're doing retail, you're doing um, daily deployment to your store from your local warehouse, you need to go in daily forecasting. Now you could also be the manager of a production plant and you might doing weekly production batches and you need to have weekly deployment to some of your clients. It's a weekly forecast that you need. What I see more and more, and this is very a general statement, but it's very important. I see so many supply chain that they're really stuck in. We do monthly forecast. And when you really ask about it, like, why do you do that? There is no reason, but yeah, but the forecast software was set up like this. So we have been doing this for 10 years. We continue. And when you ask, but do you take any monthly decision? Not really. They have a monthly process, but then when they cut it per week, it's just a flat cut divided by four and we have a weekly forecast. Despite the fact that they understand they have month, within the month seasonalities, they need to take weekly deployment. No one is interested. And that's such a pity. Again, to people listening, if you want to create value for your supply chain, it's not so much about let's make a more accurate forecast. It's about let's forecast the, the right useful thing, which might be per week. Right, thanks a lot for this answer. There is one very big question and I will try to make it much shorter. So um, you said that uh, sometimes software systems do not track uh, the demand, they track sales and uh, there are some different ways to get the values from it. And so the, the question is actually how to get the demand. Is there a, a golden rule and uh, related to this, how to automate this process? Oof. Yeah, first, I think the easiest is to track shortages. And when you see a shortage, you stop tracking forecast error because it makes no sense. And you try to find a forecasting model that can bypass it. Again, most software cannot do that. I would advise you to look for such a uh, software or model. Obviously, if you're interested, just drop me a message. We can discuss it further. But that's my first advice. Track shortages, because as soon as you have a shortage, you have an issue of demand and sales. Otherwise, you need to be sure that your client, obviously, you can only do this in B2B, can make an order and the order stays in the system and no one, no one touches the initial re initially requested delivery date. If people start to mix with it, you just offset demand as soon as you have a shortage and then demand would just be shifted around. It's really bad. Right, so you need to have the sales order management system if you're in B2B. If you're B2C, you can only track shortages. Okay, great. Uh, and how do you track shortages? Shortages. Let's say you use machine learning. Do you introduce dummy variables or things like that? Ah, so first you need to track it just using SAP, ERP system, whatever. Every day you need to get a report. Day by day you need to know your inventory level at the end of the day just to know what happened. Then you can use it as in a forecasting model. That's a very interesting question. I like to do it two different ways. Statistical models, I should just bypass these periods just as outliers, so they just bypass them. That's how you deal with it with statistical model. It works really well. Machine learning, um, that's a very interesting case. I don't use it so much as a dummy. You could use it as a feature saying, well, yesterday it was out of stock, so I'm expecting that today we have more. But at least you can remove from the data set any day, any week that was out of stock. So your model doesn't learn to forecast this without inventory. Okay, great. Uh, another question. 
What do you think is better option to order lower quantity and risk to have stockouts or to order more and potentially have higher costs? Ah, that's such a great inventory question. Um, so to answer the question, it all depends on exactly what's your supply chain, what's the lead time, what are the typical costs you face, do you have um, uh, expiration dates on your product and so on. So there is no general answer, but it's a whole question of supply chain of your transaction cost and so on. So this could lead us to a four hour discussion. I would love to have it though. So. Yes. Yeah, this is not a simple question, isn't it? But maybe mm. if I can add something there, I think that whatever the answer is to this question, if even we can answer it, it should not be answered within the forecast. It's an inventory, a supply planning issue. The forecast should be an unbiased um, prediction of the future and it needs to be unbiased. And then any risk taking and risk aversion, it's all about planning and inventory. So it's another discussion for another team. Mm -hmm. There is a related question. Uh, would you recommend inventory to be about uh, X percent higher than the forecast in EVS? How do you determine X? But this is a very big uh, topic, I think, but maybe you can provide short comment. The, the only answer I can do in a few seconds is uh, it's it's a very complicated topic and I would, I would then really promote my book here. You, 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 you need to um, um, it's it's not something you can discuss in just a few minutes and for sure you cannot just say yeah I want to um, I want to do 10% more than the forecast because it just depends on your supply chain the lead time your costs and so on so it's more complicated than that yes I, I agree. maybe we need a special meeting on that Ivan <laughs> a separate uh, webinar on this topic I would maybe, love to do so yeah maybe several uh, actually courses explaining this um, something, let me find something provocative uh, for the closing <laughs> remarks. Uh, so when you say you know, we prefer forecast one than the forecast two or things like that, you actually have two dimensions, uh, mean absolute error and bias. But how do you make a decision? Because uh, in one case, mean absolute error is lower, in the other case, the bias is lower. Or yeah, maybe sure, not, I, I yeah. shared my side again. Mm -hmm. What I like to do is really to just sum up the mean absolute error and bias. And you should see it on my slide. So here, this first forecast would get a score of 68.4%, whereas here, forecast number two could get a score of 32 plus 65, which would be 97. So I would take the lowest score and forecast one has the lowest score of 68, whereas the other one has a score of nearly 100. Um, I, I've been using this course so much that one of the company I'm working with even started calling, uh, calling it the Vanderput score. So it's kind, kind of fun, but that's how I would do it. At some point you need to do a trade off. So I'm just summing both. Now, obviously, I'm not saying it's the only way to do it and that's the best way to do it or it's perfect, but I think it's a, a very simple way to do it and it works quite well. OK, thanks. I see a comment of Mike Gilliland actually. Ah, uh, hi Mike. There is a big one and I think the, he says that uh, it would be great to rebrand FVE to FAA, but maybe it's a bit too late for that. Uh, and the reason why he does not discuss bias because not many companies actually do FVE on bias. Mm, so yeah. it's just to yeah. add to the discussion. So if you still have some questions to Nicola, please uh, get in touch with him on LinkedIn. I'm sure he will reply and provide a lot of insightful comments. Uh, but we have to finish now. Thanks everyone for participating. Thank you very much, Nicola, for your Thank you, great Nicola, presentation. Very interesting. Thanks. Thanks, John, to uh, comments and see you all. Bye bye. Bye, -bye. Ciao, Thank you so much for the support on the team. Bye everyone. Bye. Ciao, Robert. Bye. bye.